Welcome to Cinematic Excrement. As we continue to look at movies that have won the Razzie for Worst Picture, we now find ourselves in the year 2002. The winner that year was swept away, starring the material girl herself, Madonna. Unless you've been living under a rock for the last 40 years, you probably have at least a passing familiarity with Madonna's musical career, so I won't dwell on that. And if you have been living under a rock, go skim her Wikipedia page and then come back. Suffice to say, she's a legendary singer and performer, known for making great music and constantly pushing boundaries. And her success in the musical world quickly transitioned into a film career, starting way back in 1985 with Desperately Seeking Susan. Now I know what some of you who just skimmed that Wikipedia page are going to tell me. And yes, technically the first movie Madonna made was A Certain Sacrifice in 1979. But that was a no-budget indie flick she made before anyone knew who she was, and it actually went unreleased until six years later, after Desperately Seeking Susan was already out, because the director realized, hey, that girl who was in my no-budget indie flick all those years ago is a famous singer and actress now. I should capitalize on this. But as far as the general public is concerned, her first movie was Desperately Seeking Susan. So there. Anyway, while Desperately Seeking Susan wasn't my cup of tea, she was legitimately pretty good in it, and it did reasonably well at the box office. That led to her getting other movie roles, and she's had critical and commercial success with movies like A League of Their Own and Evita, which earned her a Golden Globe. Although the Golden Globes are a bit sketchy. These are the same people who thought The Martian was a comedy. No, I haven't let that go, and I think I will die mad about it. But Madonna has also had her fair share of critically panned performances and commercial flops. Swept Away was not her first run-in with the Razzies. In a previous episode, I mentioned Body of Evidence, which was nominated for Worst Picture, but lost to Indecent Proposal. The next best thing was also nominated for Worst Picture, but had no chance of beating Battlefield Earth that year. And she's won multiple acting Razzies over the years, including Worst Actress of the Century in 2000, which I personally think is bullshit. None of the movies they looked at were older than the Razzies itself, and even if they were being honest and called it Worst Actress of the Last 20 Years, Bo Derek should have won that hands down. Bo Derek can't act to save her life. Madonna, on the other hand, has shown she can turn in a good performance if she has the right part and the right director. That's probably why Swept Away didn't work, because she had neither of those things. But before we talk about Swept Away, I suppose we should talk about... Swept Away. That is to say, the original Swept Away from 1974, on which the 2002 movie is based. Directed by Lena Wertmuller, the original title was Travolti da un insolito destino nel azzurro mare d'agosto, or Swept Away by an Unusual Destiny in the Blue Sea of August. Boy, that's a mouthful. The film stars Mariangela Melato as Raffaella Lanzetti, a rich woman vacationing with friends on a yacht in the Mediterranean who, largely due to her own arrogance, ends up stranded on a deserted island with one of the crew, Gennarino Caruncchio, played by Giancarlo Giannini. The two are at odds from the beginning as they have very different... well, everything. Raffaella is a wealthy capitalist from northern Italy, while Gennarino is a poor communist from the south. She berates him at every available opportunity when she's not ranting about politics, and both of these things infuriate Gennarino, but he bites his tongue to avoid losing his job. I'm sure many can relate. One day, her friends go off to explore some nearby caves, but she misses the trip, having slept in. Against the entire crew's advice, she demands Gennarino take her out to meet them. And the dinghy's motor craps out, and they end up stranded on the aforementioned island. Gennarino, a fisherman, doesn't have too much trouble surviving in the harsh environment. But Raffaella has led a sheltered life and has no survival instincts whatsoever. And now Gennarino finds he has the power and will only help Raffaella if he decides she's earned it. While Raffaella complains the situation isn't fair and she deserves to survive just as much as he. And thus their political roles have effectively reversed. The movie was critically acclaimed at the time and is widely regarded as a classic. I guess I can kinda see why, but boy was it not my thing. On the one hand, the acting is pretty solid, and Wertmuller is clearly a gifted director. I believe she was the first female director to get an Oscar nomination. And you'd think I'd enjoy a film about a working-class hero getting revenge on some horrible rich bitch. Unfortunately, Gennarino falls short of becoming a sympathetic character, as he's kind of a misogynist. This, boys and girls, is what we call a product of its time. And after they get to the island, he forces her to wait on him hand and foot and call him master, and he smacks her around a lot. A whole lot. 
and he seems to enjoy doing it a little too much. Like, dude, I get it, she's terrible, but you're not doing yourself any favors here either. And some of his lines are just creepy as hell. Jesus! There's even a moment where he loses his shit entirely and tries to rape her. But he backs off at the last minute, suggesting it would be even more satisfying to make her fall in love with him. And somehow, she does. I mean, almost right away. Because as any woman on Twitter can attest, nothing turns them on more than rape threats. Now, I don't think Vertmuller was necessarily trying to make this a male power fantasy, considering she is, you know, a woman, and an avowed feminist to boot, but it seems like that's kind of where she ended up, even if it was unintentional. I can understand people in 1974 looking at this differently, but in 2021, it's hard to give that a pass. Some critics who defended the film have suggested people who focused on the misogyny missed the movie's message about class warfare. And I really do not buy that. I mean, the message is kinda hard to miss. The very first scene in the movie shows Rafaela and one of her friends having a very spirited political discussion. And this kind of thing happens a lot during the film. And the class conflict between Gennarino and Rafaela is plainly visible long before it gets violent. The message about class warfare isn't even subtext, it's just text. You'd have to sleep through the film to miss that. One critic even suggested the sexual violence is meant to symbolize political violence. And maybe? But I feel like there are better ways to do that. And again, the message is not in any way subtle. Why bother symbolizing what you've already spelled out for the audience? That, to me, seems to be the very definition of pointless symbolism. In any case, they are eventually rescued, Rafaela is reunited with her husband, and we find out Gennarino is also married and has kids, who we never see for some reason. But he's ready to give up all of that to be with Rafaela, and it looks like she wants the same thing, but she backs out at the last moment and stays with her husband. And his wife finds out about their affair, and naturally she's upset, and in the end, he's left all alone. And it's very... Sad? Except I don't feel the least bit sad about that at all. They were both horrible people, and they were horrible for each other. In fact, Gennarino was horrible for anyone, considering he was willing to dump his wife and kids without a second thought. Girl, talk about it. So, that's the original swept away, which brings us to the 2002 remake. In this version, Madonna plays the Raffaella character, renamed Amber, and the Gennarino character, now known as Giuseppe, or Pepe to his friends, is played by Giancarlo Giannini's son, Adriano. The movie was directed by Madonna's husband at the time, Guy Ritchie, which I'm sure caused a lot of head-scratching, even more so than their marriage, as the only two movies he had under his belt at the time were Snatch and Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels. This just didn't seem like it was in his wheelhouse. And if you saw the live-action version of Aladdin or King Arthur Legend of the Sword, you know what happens when Guy Ritchie tries to get out of his wheelhouse. And you know what really baffles me about Ritchie's version of Swept Away? It's almost the exact same story. You got the rich, f you, I got mine, capitalist lady, and the poor communist and somewhat sexist fisherman. She treats him like dirt the entire time they're on the boat, when she's not ranting about capitalism, but then they get stranded on a deserted island, and suddenly he's in charge instead, and there's the slapping around, and the almost rape. Yeah, they even copied that. Yeesh. And then they inexplicably fall in love, and are eventually rescued, and will they stay with each other, or return to their old lives, and what was even the point of this? Why update the movie if you're not going to update the movie. Even some of the dialogue sounds like it was lifted from the original, like when Amber refers to Pepe as a hairy black midget. No, really, she actually calls him that. I can't reason with a hairy black midget. Now, in the original Swept Away, Gennarino was repeatedly referred to as a black man from the South, which threw me at first because I was born and raised in the United States, and obviously he's not an African-American from Atlanta. But having the darker complexion associated with the southern region of the country, Gennarino would be referred to as a black man in 1970s Italy. I honestly don't know if Pepe would also be considered black in 2002, but that really doesn't matter because Amber is American. No American would call this guy black. He's not Afro-Italian. Calling him a midget is even more confusing, and not just because that's a politically incorrect term, even for 2002. Adriano Giannini is almost six feet tall. No one would ever consider him a little person, especially Madonna, who's about 5'3". I guess he is a bit hairy, so one out of three, but still, what the hell? Now, I will say, while the story is largely the same, Richie did not opt for a shot-for-shot -shot remake. He did make a few minor changes here and there. 
While the original movie starts with everyone already on the yacht, the remake begins with their journey to the yacht and spends a bit more time on said yacht. So what do they do with this extra time on the yacht? Well, two things. One, they show one of Amber's friends, played by Elizabeth Banks, is a total ditz. Not that it matters, because this goes nowhere. As soon as our leads are stranded on the island, she is never mentioned again. And two, it gives Amber extra time to be extra bitchy. I did not fly all the way from New York City... New York City! ...to wherever the fuck we are to get on that. Um, what exactly is wrong with that? It's a boat. And a pretty well-maintained boat by the look of it. What the hell were you expecting? This is basically the first half hour of the movie. Amber constantly complaining about literally everything purely for the sake of it. And it gets old quick. I understand I'm not supposed to like this character, but I shouldn't be so turned off by the character that I don't want to watch the rest of the movie. And that's basically what Madonna is doing here. It doesn't help that her acting has not improved over the years, and every bad thing the critics have said about her is on full display here. Nothing about this performance feels real. Her delivery is wooden as hell, and she's basically a caricature of a spoiled rich girl. She hates everyone and everything for no goddamn reason at all. And that raises so many questions. How does someone like this have friends? How does she have a husband? How can anyone stand to be around her for more than five seconds? And why has she not run for president? I've said before that subtlety is a lost art, but in Swept Away, subtlety isn't lost. Subtlety is brutally slaughtered and dismembered and buried in a shallow grave. Are we being punished because we're rich? Mother of God. Eventually, Amber pushes Pepe too far and he finally decides enough is enough. And he dumps her food right on her stupid head and then he throws her overboard. And she, oh wait, no. It was a daydream, she's fine. Well, that one's on me for thinking this movie might actually get interesting. I don't know what I was thinking. Richie also tries to update the political debates by throwing in some modern topics, like pesticides. I use the word tries because it doesn't work very well. I thought the politics in the original were a bit heavy-handed, but Richie somehow manages to one-up that. In a way, I'm almost impressed. He also adds a really weird dream sequence after our unhappy couple end up stranded on the island where Madonna sings, Come on to my house. Except she's not actually singing, Come on to my house. She's lip-syncing to Della Rees singing, Come on to my house. What is even the point of this? Why would you take someone like Madonna, who can actually sing, and have her lip-sync to someone else's song? This boggles the mind. Guy, were you somehow not aware that your wife was an accomplished singer? It's kind of her thing. And then we have the ending, which starts out the same as the original. Some vacationers stumble across the island and pick them up, even though Amber would, for some reason, rather stay on the island with Pepe. And I'm not buying for a second that someone like her would want to live on a deserted island any longer than she has to. I don't want to go back. I don't want to be tested. Oh, relax, you drama queen. All they do is stick a swab up your nose. You'll be fine. But in this version, Pepe is not married and has no children, so he's not abandoning anything by pursuing Amber. And he tries to convince her to leave her husband and go with him by leaving her a message at the hotel. But her husband intercepts the message and she's forced to stay with him. And I suppose that does make Pepe a bit more sympathetic compared to Generino, since he's not dumping his own family. And it makes the ending a bit more sad, since Amber did not leave Pepe willingly. But I really don't get the husband's motivation. I mean... Why, in the name of all that is good and green on this earth, would you want to stay married to that? Just why? I don't care if she's rich. It cannot be worth it. If she wants to leave you, let her. You got off lucky. Give her whatever alimony she wants. That divorce is a bargain at any price. And Pepe takes the ring he bought her and throws it into the air and, oh, come on. Did we really need the CGI ring? Visual effects do not automatically make your movie better. Zack Snyder, take note. But as I said, these changes are relatively minor, and I don't think Richie's version improved on the original, apart from somehow being half an hour shorter despite all the additional scenes. So what was the point? Why waste all this time remaking an old art house flick from the 70s for 90 minutes of mediocrity? You don't have to compete with 18-year-olds. Ah, there it is. Yep, this is nothing more than a vanity project. It's a chance for Madonna to tell the world that despite being in her 40s, she is still smoking hot, thank you very much. And for the record, she was right. 
but I like to think I'm doing pretty well for 40 and you don't see me making movies about it. Well, that's Guy Ritchie swept away. It's irritating, it's insufferable, it's a pointless vanity project, and it's inferior to the original in almost every way. And I didn't think the original was all that great to begin with. And boy howdy did this bomb big time despite its relatively low $10 million budget. Domestically, it only grossed about $600,000. That's it. And when you add the international box office, it barely tops a million. Hell, in the UK, Richie's home country, it didn't even get a theatrical release. It went direct to video. Ooh, that had to sting. I kind of feel bad for him. That's not true. Out of seven nominations, the movie took home five Razzies. Worst Director for Richie, Worst Actress for Madonna, tying with Britney Spears for Crossroads, Worst Screen Couple for Madonna and Janini, Worst Remake or Sequel, and of course, Worst Picture. And now we come to the part of this review where I decide if this movie really deserves its Worst Picture honors. And I need to think about that one because... Ooh, I'm not really sure. I mean... Swept Away is bad for many reasons, but it doesn't stand out to me as one of those astonishing, horrible, legendary bad movies like Freddy Got Fingered or Battlefield Earth. Nor did it bore me to tears. I will give it that much. It is not boring. It's just... bad. That's it. And even when I look at its fellow Worst Picture nominees from that year, I'm not so sure anything really stands out. You have The Adventures of Pluto Nash, which was a sci-fi comedy that forgot the comedy parts, but apart from a really stupid twist at the end, that was largely forgettable. You have Crossroads, a vehicle for Britney Spears, for some reason. The only thing I remember about that was the mediocre cover of I Love Rock and Roll. That was a terrible mistake, much like Britney's conservatorship. But otherwise, it's also largely forgettable. You have Roberto Benigni's Pinocchio, a relatively faithful retelling of the original story, which is really only memorable because Benigni decided to play the part of Pinocchio himself, while he was pushing 50. Science has yet to explain why. And on this side of the Atlantic, it had a really bad English dub, but that's not Benigni's fault, that's on Miramax. The Italian version... It's weird, but it doesn't strike me as one of the worst movies ever. And of course, there's Star Wars Episode II, Attack of the Clones. Not sure I can say anything about the movie that hasn't already been said. But while I wouldn't call it a good movie, I can't bring myself to hate it. There's plenty it did wrong, but it's still Star Wars. Honestly, the more I think about it, the more I think this may have been one of those years where the Razzies completely missed the boat. I can think of several other terrible movies from that year that went largely overlooked by the Razzie voters. Some of them I've already talked about on this very silly YouTube channel. There's Eight Crazy Nights, an animated holiday flick from Adam Sandler that spent so much time being disgusting and mean-spirited that it forgot to be funny. There's Die Another Day, one of the worst Bond movies ever made, which also happened to feature a cameo from Madonna. There's Ballistic X vs. Sever, an incredibly lame action movie riddled with plot holes and devoid of logic. And there's a movie I have not talked about on this show, The Master of Disguise. Dana Carvey, what happened to you? I swear you were funny once upon a time. I don't think I imagined that. But this? This was awful. Any of those movies would have been a worthy contender for Worst Picture, and yet they largely escaped the eyes of the Golden Raspberry Foundation. Hell, Ballistic X vs. Sever, one of the worst-reviewed movies of all time, didn't get a nomination in any category. How did that happen? Honestly, now that I've had a minute to think about it, that's the worst movie of 2002. With Eight Crazy Nights being a close second. So yeah, the Razzie screwed the pooch this year. Swept Away was bad, but it wasn't the worst movie of the year. Don't get me wrong though, it's still not worth your time. I don't even think the original is worth your time either, to be honest. It hasn't aged well. It might be worth a watch as an artifact of cinematic history, but that's about it. And the remake won't have a chance to age well because it was dead on arrival. In fact, it was so bad that it basically ended Madonna's acting career. She was part of the English dub for Luc Besson's Arthur and the Invisibles and directed a couple of movies as well, but she never appeared on the big screen again. And honestly, that's probably for the best. It gives her more time to focus on the music. You know, the thing she's actually good at. Next time, we move ahead to the year 2003, which means it's finally time to tackle Gili. And I really don't know what to expect. Believe it or not, I have never seen the movie. At least, not all the way through. I've seen bits of it. Who knows? Maybe I'll like it. 
Okay, that's unlikely, but hey, in these trying times, you gotta have hope. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and Hollywood can suck it. I want this battle filled with water. And be quick about it.